Good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you are. And this is NASM Live, and I'm Prentice Rhodes, your host. And I am here, as always, with Wendy Batts and Marty Miller. How are you all doing today? Great. Fantastic. Okay, so let's, since we, since I feel like we've, we have a relationship, we've gotten to know each other really well over the past two or three weeks, probably more than we've, uh, we've talked more than we have over the last 10 years of, uh, of knowing each other. So we can dive right into today's topic. And today's topic, uh, what we want to accomplish is give all of you listening an overview of your basic assessments. So your overhead squat assessment, your, your modified and your single leg squat assessments. So let's take it away. So Wendy, or this is for both of you actually, but Wendy, you can start. Why are assessments important anyway? Why do them? Why don't we just get after it in the gym? Well, basically the reason we do the assessment is we wanna to get to know the client. We need to know what their specific goals are. Um, we don't wanna just to design a program for the sake of designing a program. And then when we start to do more of the movement assessments such as the overhead squat, the modified squat and the single leg squat, we're looking to see if there's any specific common comp like movement patterns that aren't ideal. So that kind of gives us a blueprint. So when we're designing a program, we're designing a program with a purpose and not just for the sake of, of designing a program. Okay, and uh, Marty, what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts yeah, on that? To, yeah, to echo everything when he said, it's, you know, I simply put it as if I'm not assessing, I'm guessing. We all tend to say that as instructors. It gives us that starting point. But also, a lot of times, it gives us the ability to communicate with our client to give them a reason why we have them doing things that they may not have thought that were necessary. Like, they didn't come into, hey, can you teach me how to foam roll? They came into maybe burn calories or have some other type of higher aspiration in their mind. So when we talk about movement assessments, I mean, there's obviously a whole bunch of other type of assessments, but strictly talking movement is they may not know they have movement dysfunction. So it's my ability to then, you know, create an opportunity to show them, hey, we have a strategy here. And let's say you want to run a 5K, 10K. You know how you always get that anterior knee pain every time you start to add volume and distance? Here's some of the reasons why. And what I love now is the ability to use their phone, in my opinion, video it and let them see it because they don't understand what we're seeing. So I like to, you know, I ask permission, can I video it? Can I put it on your phone? Because it's their content, it's their movement. And I ask them to save it. So over time, they now come back to it and say, look it, look how much better you're moving. And then it just gives them that visualization. We learn better by seeing. So that's just a, another add on to everything that Wendy said, which I agree with 100%. <laughs> Yeah, and I wanted to key in on something that you said, Marty, uh, just regarding because all three of us have uh, worked in the healthcare industry. All of us were licensed healthcare professionals. And I just wanted to uh, uh, just remind people out there listening who don't have that level of licensure that we're not there to deal specifically with anterior knee pain, where Marty, Marty's uh, background as an athletic trainer he absolutely can deal with that. Now, that's not to say that we will never come into contact with anyone who's in pain, but that's not our job uh, as trainers with doing this assessment. We're, we're here to improve their movement quality and to help them get, uh, get stronger, more efficient to accomplish their goals and stronger. And you know what, if they happen to get out of pain, uh, it's okay. That's not our goal. So I just want everyone. I just want everyone to uh, remember that. So moving on, uh, why do we set? Why do we set up our assessment in the way that we do? Why do we demand that our feet are pointing straight ahead? I know that when I talk to trainers, I hear, well, this is how I squat. I squat with my feet turned out and I get under the bar and I go down and up. Why are we assessing with uh, the feet in the width at the width that they're uh, set up? Why are they pointing straight ahead? Why are we bringing our arms over our head? Uh, Wendy. Well, basically we set them up in the five kinetic chain checkpoint. So feet straight ahead, knees over second and third toe, hips in a neutral position, obviously shoulders um, in a neutral position as well as the head. So we do that because 
that way we have a starting point. And then at that point, when they start to move, we can see where any deviations occur and then we can mark that. So therefore we have, um, we can see what's ideal movement and then maybe where some compensations lie again, because that's what we take the information. You know, we get that information to, to write a program that's going to be very specific for them to help them move better, feel better. And then of course, perform better. Yes, absolutely. And I wanted to key in on something, uh, that that you said as well we want to we want to set them up in their five kinetic chain checkpoints and i just want to let everyone know out there that while you may squat if you're if you're a competitive squatter or whatever you may do things in that way but most of our lives happen <laughs> Uh, with those five kinetic chain checkpoints like if you let your feet turn out and you go out and sprint you're going to run like a duck so we want to assess <laughs> we want to assess you in the position where you're going to uh, uh, do most of your activities of daily living. Most of your sports are going to be played adhering to these checkpoints in some kind of way. Uh, Marty, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, and I think it's important to you know not overcoach what you're looking for because you want to see if they fall out of those kinetic chain checkpoints. But if you don't start them in the right position, you can make some other oh, feet are turned out. Well, what if they don't know to keep them straight ahead? So we, you know, we give a general guideline, start like this and don't tell people what to do. But if you don't give them the opportunity to start in that setup, you don't know if they could have been in and controlled that. So it's not that we're over coaching. Keep this. Don't move this. Do this. It's, hey, feet straight ahead. And I've had clients like <laughs> I ask them, put their feet straight ahead. And I demonstrate it to them. And then by the time I get to the next thing, I already see them creeping their feet back out because it's just so uncomfortable for them. At that point, they've proven to me that they can't keep them there. But at least I give them the opportunity to start in a neutral position because all of tests, if you want valid results, you have to have a norm to go by from a standardization of the test. So that's all we're really looking for is establishing a norm to see if they deviate off that norm. And then we can understand what their true compensations are. Very good, thank you for that. And I want, let's stay with you, Marty. Uh, why, do we, why do we do our modified assessments with our heels up, with our, with our arms down, and what sorts of value information can we get from that in the assessment process? The beautiful thing of the movement assessments is it takes a very complex movement system and simplifies it for one, the personal trainer that's assessing that motion, as well as it makes it very simple to get through the screens quickly for the person that's coming in to go through the assessments, because they might've come in and thought they were working out. So when you look at the modified, very quickly, it opens up an opportunity for the fitness professional to say, okay, when I elevate their heels, did things get drastically better? And if they do, right then and there, you know that primarily, they probably have a movement dysfunction at their foot and ankle. So it doesn't take a lot of extra steps. You don't have to have the skill to do goniometric measurements. You don't have to have the skill to do manual muscle testing. It's basically, I watched them squat, things improved when I elevated their feet. Right then and there, you know that you're gonna have to spend some time on their foot and ankle. If it doesn't improve and that you're seeing the same thing, again, very quickly, now you know, okay, even though it looked like a foot and ankle issue, it's probably up the kinetic chain more, more of a hip issue. So very easy for the individual going through the assessment, as well as the fitness professional to get great re reproducible results as well. Yes, outstanding. And like you said earlier, uh, get, and it gives us a way to standardize. It gives us a way to get through, to get a lot of, to funnel down a lot of complex information into easily usable uh, pieces. So that's good. And and Wendy, can you talk about what's going on with uh, when we bring our arms down for our uh, modified assessment, hands on hips? Absolutely. So again, you know what you got to think about when we raise our arms. It's usually we're looking at what's happening at the lats, and because the lats attach in the back as well as in the front of the shoulder, it we can easily see if the arms are falling forward as well as if they are um, if they have an anterior pelvic tilt. So if we bring the hands down and put them on the hips, that also is a, a good indicator on did, did it clean up? And if, if it did, then you know that probably the lats aren't, um, or if it did clean up, then the lats are, are primarily 
a muscle that you really want to focus on it on foam rolling as well as stretching to clean up those two compensations that are that we had seen previously with the arms overhead okay thanks thanks for that and uh let's stay with you wendy what about a single leg squat assessment? Is that something that's, uh, that's necessary? Well, first of all, why do we do it? Mm -hmm. Why do we do that? Well, so, so again, we're still just trying to gather information. That's the whole purpose of why we do the squats. And so if somebody has a pretty clean squ overhead squat assessment test, they did, you know, we didn't have to do a modified and let's say they are a little bit more um, advanced the single leg squat, when we have someone do that, we can check out what's happening um, and their balance. But then also if we saw, let's say the knees go out in a two-legged overhead squat, that's not really a common compensation that we see very often. So if I am kind of unsure about what's happening at the foot and ankle as well as the hip, if I put them on one leg, I may see a completely different result, meaning that their arches collapse or their knees cave in. So I would end up taking that information and, and it would override what I would see on the overhead squat assessment. And then that way I know, again, how to program it for those specific compensations. So now I'm not sharing the weight on two legs. I'm actually seeing what happens on one on each side, of course. Okay, very good. So now let me, uh, and let's follow up with that. I have a, actually a couple of follow-up questions for that. Uh, so. How do you take all of this information? How does all of this information from all of these assessments drive what you do as, as a trainer, as a coach? Uh, Marty. Certainly, so it comes from experience. So the key thing is in your textbook, you're given the solution tables. So every single time you see a movement compensation, go back to the solution table or carry that around like on your clipboard as a frame of reference. And the more you digest that, if you're every single person you're assessing and or every time you give somebody an exercise, it's still a movement assessment, right? A push up or a lunge. You're still going to see the same issues with the kinetic chain. You just continually go back to that solutions table and eventually you will start to see the patterns. You will start to learn how to address those. And then you again, you go through the training and you go through the different uh, programming that we put in there between the foam rolling and what to lengthen and what to activate and how to you know bring into a stabilization training and you will get better at it by doing it. Don't just assess somebody and then go right back to what you've been doing from a training standpoint before because you know it's gonna get you the results you want. So it's just seriously taking this as this is how you train people. You assess, you go to the solutions table, you implement and then watch these amazing results. And I always say, you're your own first client. So work on your own movement of inefficiencies first, and you will get even a true better understanding of how great this works for you. And then it carries over to your everyday practice. Awesome. So uh, this, next, uh, this next question is for you, Wendy. Now, do you have, when you're, when you're going through your assessments, do you have any, uh, any reference ranges? And what I'm getting at is, if we're looking at a compensation like uh, knees moving in, for example, and I'm and I'm a really particular trainer, and I say, "Oh wow, that that knee moved a micrometer. I think it moved a micrometer. Uh, is that is that a knees in compensation?" Uh, so do you? Uh, and what I'm getting at is, per at each kinetic chain checkpoint, do you have a reference range that would let you say that's definitely a compensation? to be addressed. Certainly. Um, so, so this is kind of, you can look at it a bunch of different ways. Again, if you have someone that is a professional athlete and they come in and you know, you've read the textbook and you had someone do five squats from the anterior view and then five squats from the lateral view and you didn't see any compensations. It may be because again, they're stronger and they they can control some of their movement patterns. Now, as we know with athletes, they're usually a wreck anyway, but I'm just using that as an example. So you, you take some steps back, and this is what I do when I assess, I set them up in the five kinetic chain checkpoints, and rather than stopping them each and every time, I end up telling them to keep going and let them know that I'm gonna walk around, so therefore I can see 
um, you know, from the anterior view, what's happening. I look at it from five. I keep them squatting. Now, again, only if I know that they can handle that. And then I look at them from a lateral view. I peek at the pack, you know, the back to see the posterior, if there's any compensations with a shift or their feet. And then I come back to the front and I relook at the anterior view again. And a lot of times as clients get tired, that's really when you start to see the compensations, especially if you're not sure from the very beginning. So if I'm looking at the foot, I mean, I am seeing, did they, did their toes move out from where they started? Because again, as they get more tired, you may see those, um, those compensations get uh, more and more visible. And then the same thing with the knee. I mean, when you ask the question, I'm really looking kind of at the kneecap and seeing if that kneecap stays in line with the second and third toe. If it kind of creeps in a little bit over the, the first and second toe and they have squatted maybe more than five times, I may not mark that unless, you know, you can really see like at the hip that the femur's caving in. Um, but, but again, even if I think to be safe, just go ahead and mark it. And then it's not going to hurt anything if you have someone, you know, uh, if you go into inhibiting or lengthening the the adductor complex or the lateral gastroc or something, because those are usually muscles that um, are overactive in, in multiple compensations. So. OK, thank you for that. And we do have uh, we did get a question and this question is from Charles. Thank you for uh, uh joining on hopping on today charles uh his question is what is the scientific evidence that squatting with feet parallel and hip width apart is correct what is the evidence he goes on uh what is the evidence that squatting with feet pointing uh straight forward is better than feet and thighs pointing somewhat outward assuming someone can squat with turnout and pretty deep and with a neutral spine, why should we correct this? Uh, Marty, go ahead and uh, go ahead and tackle this for Charles. Sir, we got to start with when we define correct. Are we talking correct biomechanically, or are we talking correct in the sense that you're asking someone to get below parallel because it's a competition? I grew up in the powerlifting phase of you know late '80s, early '90s. You had to break parallel to have a good squat. So people would work around, you know, they would turn their feet out, they would arch their back, because I could have perfect biomechanical form, but if I stopped below, above parallel, the judges weren't gonna give me the green light. So really, that's what we have to define first. Are we talking about, are you asking someone to get below a depth because they're gonna be judged if they are playing professional football, division one football, or a powerlifting meet? Or are you talking about just pure biomechanics? So if we're gonna go into the world of biomechanics, we can look at force couple relationships, length tension relationships, joint arthrokinematics. We know from research the body can handle load better when it's in its ideal posture, when things are in a neutral position. And when a muscle is not too short, a muscle is not too long, it activates better and performs better. Now, I have restrictions in my calf. I don't right now. I work on it all the time. I get better as the more I work on it. I would not be able to break parallel without changing my biomechanics. Could I get below parallel? Absolutely, but I'd have my feet turn out, which now, if you go through the biomechanics, has shortened a few muscles, one including my glute muscles, which are supposed to be the prime mover of a squat. We know from research, unequivocally, a shortened muscle is not as strong as a muscle in its normal position. Also, if I turn my feet out, I've changed the length of my hamstring complex, the bicep femoris, sacro tuberous ligament which attaches on my sacrum and now it's being pulled on i may not feel it right now but biomechanically i'm absolutely not structurally sound from an orthopedic standpoint yes i could say man that was a great squat i got deep but once you and the other thing we talked i think he said something about neutral in his spine there's only a certain amount of hip flexion you have if you have optimal hip flexion after you go to a certain point, you have to posteriorly tilt your pelvis because your femur will not go any deeper. Most people don't have ideal hip flexion because most people are tight. So let's say you get to 100 degrees. At some point, your pelvis has to posteriorly rotate. Now, people look at it and say, that's a great squat. It's an impressive depth. But once you posteriorly rotate, your lumbar spine is not neutral. 
the shear forces in a loaded position in that are definitely increased in a neutral position. And then as you come out of that, your adductor magnus has to do a lot of that work and not your glue. So I'm not going to say not to do it. I'm just going to come back to what's the reason why. If I wanted to compete in a powerlifting meet next week, I promise you I'm, not, I'm going to have to do it with some compensation. But if my goal is to compete and break 90 degrees, then I work around that. But I go back to Prentice, you talked, I'm an athletic trainer. That means I studied sport injuries. It's not a matter if athletes get hurt, it's a matter of when. We don't compete in sports because they're good for us orthopedically. And that includes now the fitness sports you see out there. There, you know, some of the big names that are out there, but any of those activities that it's a sport of how much can I lift, how often can I lift it, all those, you know, those activities. That doesn't mean that it's biomechanically sound. So my job as a fitness professional, I know I'm going long here, is to do no harm first. And if it's a fitness enthusiast, I don't see the need to have them squat beyond what they can control with proper biomechanics. So I hope I explained that well. So, yeah, and I'm going to ask you a follow-up question and, sure. uh, and also key in on something that you said that was very important. Uh, it, it goes back to... What is your objective? Are we talking about the squat as purely an exercise? Then you, you do have some, you may have some leeway there if that is your only objective, is that to complete the squat. Now, when we're talking about the squat pattern as a so-called functional movement pattern, then that, that lends itself to several other activities of which if you do that, and you allow yourself to, to move out of what's ideal, and uh, both of you be prepared for what's ideal, that's coming up next. Uh, but if you, if you try to perform extensively out of what is, is ideal, you may predispose yourself to some, some challenges later. Which leads me to my next question, what's, what's ideal? Now there are uh, three of us, three of us that all of you can see out there. And then we have a producer in the background, uh, very stylish today, I might add. Uh, <laughs> we, all have, we all have vastly different body types. So uh, you brought up normal, Marty, what, what's normal? Yeah. What's Scary question. Generally speaking, everyone's born with the right biomechanics, well, not biomechanics, with the right you know, um, abilities from an orthopedic standpoint. There are people who absolutely from birth have you know, flat feet or other true orthopedic issues that they will then face the rest of their life that you know, scoliosis, et cetera. Doesn't mean you still don't wanna work on it and try to get as ideal as possible. Then there's the people who get injured, whether it's car accidents, whether it's falls, whether it's sport injuries that now change your biomechanics. So it's such a broad question that, you know, what I would say is that when people say, well, I have long femurs. Well, but you're also taller. You have a longer torso <laughs> under X-ray. You know, the odds of you having four extra inches on your femur compared to me in ratio to my not going to happen as often as people say it is. It's what happens is that is their norm because that's the way they've trained. That's the way they've learned to move and they haven't learned to move differently. But we know that people can change their movement patterns. And back to the for, uh, the question a minute ago with Charles with the squat is a squat doesn't have to be a loaded exercise, right? We go through phase one. A squat is an unloaded. It's a movement pattern. But a lot of people say, well, I need to squat and have my feet turned out. Well, it's because you're already focused on your strength phase. Let us clean you up in your stabilization phase. And then when you get to strength phase, maybe you're moving better again. And also when your feet are turned out, you have a wider base of support. So if you haven't done all your core work in stabilization, you're going to feel better with your feet turned out because it's a wider base of support. So there's all these factors that go into it. So normal, again, are we have the 206 bones that are moved by over 600 plus muscles. We're all built the same. Most of us are born with, you know, everything working fine. We adapt over time due to positional things, injuries, et cetera. So we, there is a norm the way the body is wired to be put together. Right. And uh, Wendy, did you have anything to add to that, this discussion? I mean, not really, because as Marty said, I mean, we're all born and, and made to move a certain way. And I and we're looking for ideal alignment, meaning that, you know, the muscles on each end of the joint is moving 
100% the way that it was made to move. And so my job as a trainer is to really, and, and that's why we do the five kinetic chain checkpoints is because we know that if we put someone in that ideal alignment and we train them that way and we get the body functioning and moving the way that it was meant to move, then when, when they go into their sport, so if they're a power lifter, they are going to externally rotate their, their feet. They are going to widen their base of support and they will probably be able to lift more by training with me in the five kinetic chain checkpoints when they go into their sport, because now we've got muscles again, firing the way that they were made to fire. So even though we've taken them out of the five kinetic chain checkpoints, it's for a sport. It's not necessarily for training. And so I think we want to make sure that we're differentiating the two, because again, if I'm training someone for a sport and I'm their coach, I'm going to train them the way that they're going to win. So I'm training to win. And then, but when they come into the gym, I'm training them to move at their best by putting them in the 5Ks. So it's completely different. And to Marty's point and to Charles's question, it really kind of depends on, on the whys. Because again, you know, we look at parallel lines from the lateral view, because if we have them in the five kinetic chain checkpoints, we see that there's no excessive lean and that they're moving the way that they're supposed to. There's equal weight distribution between the ankles, the knee and the hip. So it's safer for your body to move that way. So that's why we want to see how far off in the assessment are they or are they perfect there? And then we can move on into the strength phases and train them accordingly. Okay. Thank you for that, Wendy. And we want to, uh, want to keep this train rolling. So let's, uh, <laughs> Let's talk about stabilization endurance training. Why do we why do we do it? Why is that why is that important? Let's keep going with you, Wendy. So we do phase one because again, we just took we did the assessment. We got the information that we needed. And so basically now what we want to do with that information is design a program to do exactly what we've been discussing is to get the right muscles firing at the right time in the right plane of motion. I mean, everything we do is in all three planes. And so a lot of times the traditional programs are doing hypertrophy training in the sagittal plane. And so this allows us as trainers to be creative, to, you know, reinforce ideal alignment, which is going to you know give us more control over everything that we do. And then again, if we have a very stable base of support, again, we've always used this analogy of like the foundation and the house. I mean, we have to have a strong foundation before we start building upon that in order to really maximize and excel in, in, up, up the, the OPT model. All right. So uh, now, Marty, let's go, let's go back to you. So what goes into, we have stabilization training, we know whether you're you're a sedentary person or you're an athlete heading into the off season, you've developed some stuff that <laughs> that needs to be. Uh, that's a very technical term there. You develop some stuff that you're going to need to to work on so that you can start putting the body under that uh, a level of intensity and load again. Uh, what it, what goes into your uh, warm up and why is uh, executing that warm up important? Yeah, the, the beauty behind the model is there's a specific warm up for each phase that's very, you know, designed for the science behind what you're trying to accomplish. So when you look at the first phase, you're just trying to establish proper human movement. That's that's what we're that's the goal. If we had to say it in one sentence, establish proper human movement. It's not about how much you move and how fast you move. It's proper human movement. So when we look at that, whether it's an off season or whether it's part of somebody's in season, it might be the day after an event. You might need just some of that stabilization training. With the warm up, we're going to go through and do the foam rolling. That's the same for all phases. You're preparing the tissue, you're getting circulation going, you're getting the tissue to be more pliable, it's just like getting a massage. Everyone feels better by and large when they get off the massage table. They just feel more limber. So then the research shows that after we've done that foam rolling, if we need to do static stretching and chronically shortened tissue, we don't stretch every muscle, we assess. So we're going to go after the chronically shortened tissue. For most people, me included, hip flexors, calf complex, adductor complex, lats and pec, and then the muscles in our neck. We're going to lengthen those. So that way, going back to what we talked about already, we can get a better chance to be in those five kinetic chain checkpoints because we calm down the muscles that are doing too much work. So now the opposing muscle groups that are inhibited, that you know aren't firing optimally are now like, hey, wait a minute, I can, I'm not being pulled on all the time in a lengthened position, now I can fire better. So it just gets everything prepared to then be able to find those neutral positions or ideal postures as you move into the rest of the workout. 
All right, great. And yeah, that's that's important to to do every day when you wake up before you start training. Uh, you want to prep your body for life and prep your body for any uh, physical work in the gym. Uh, now, Wendy, let's talk about uh, the core. What's happening? What's happening in phase one? Uh, phase one, level one core training, and why do we do it the way we do it? Well, um, the intent of core exercises in phase one is to develop and reinforce ideal alignment and control of the hips, the low back, the trunk, the scapular thoracic complex, and all three planes of motion. So in order to do this, we typically um, program exercises that have little to no movement of the spine while performing them in order to get the client to focus on developing adequate co-activation and endurance of the core muscles. So exercises that you typically see here are going to be things like dead bug, um, a bird dog, plank variations, cobras, glute bridge variations, and you can do anti-rotationals and rotation and chops um, from you know different positions as long as you're maintaining good spinal alignment and there's little to no movement of the spine. Um, we do them at a slower tempo, so they're going to involve more isometric holds for extended periods of time. And of course, we have a higher rep scheme to challenge the stabilizers and, uh, and endurance. Okay. And I have a follow-up question for you, Wendy. Okay. Uh, now, I've heard, I've had, the, have had discussions before, or I've had the question asked of us, place core training at the beginning of the session uh, before resistance and why wouldn't we put that at the end of resistance training because we're using why would we fatigue those core muscles that we need for stability uh, before for resistance training can you can you answer that I can I think I hope anyway right um, yeah. so basically again it comes down to the assessment the reason they're in phase one is we we know that there's muscles that are in a lengthened position we know that once Marty, you know, discussed, you know, foam rolling and stretching and trying to get more length onto the overactive or shortened side of the muscle. Now we really need to focus on activating the muscles that were in a lengthened position because we know that they're not firing the way that they were they were meant to fire. So what we're trying to do is prepare the body. So again, I've always termed everything from, you know, the beginning of of foam rolling, stretching, you know, uh, core balance and plyo as an extended warm up. So we're trying to activate muscles, not necessarily, we don't want to look at it as like we're totally fatiguing these muscles. We're getting these muscles to wake up. And these are the, also the muscles that we're working on that are um, what we call intervertebral stability muscles. So the little bitty muscles that actually protect your vertebrae are the muscles that we're really focused on in phase one of core. And so that's why we do it and not necessarily at the end. I mean, if somebody wants to do more core exercises at the end of their workout, then go for it. There's no saying that they can't be done at the end as well, but that's primarily why we have it in the very beginning, right after they get done with their stretches. Yeah, so we're using this for the specific uh, principle of, of turning things on so that they can exactly. be brought into the resistance exercise. And you know, Marty, uh, talked about earlier establishing the ideal force couple re relationships. You want to have your stability system with you when you start to do more intense resistance exercises. That's uh, that's great. So let's uh, let's go back to you, Marty. And uh, why? Oh, actually, before we do, I just saw a question here from uh, uh, Scott, and we're going to go back to assessment. Uh, and Scott's question is. If the modified squat shows significant improvement, but there's still compensation, how do you mark that on your checklist? I can jump in here. So it yeah. depends, you know, depends on you know how you want to mark it yourself. So when what I would do is if if the one side was worse than the other, I might put two check marks versus one. You know, just find a system that works for you and it's reproducible in your system. So if if Prentice is in my facility and I look at his sheet, I should know what that means. You know, so the way the template is set up is not really, I see what Scott, you're saying there, that there's not another spot for that. Just find a system that works for you that you can communicate through the rest of the fitness professionals in your facility going, hey, if you see two check boxes, that means the there was more on the right versus the left. They both maybe knees adducted, but the right was more than the left. As long as there's a standardization that works, and then it's the same thing with the modified. If it cleans it up a lot, but not fully, you know, just put plus, 
you know what I mean? Where if it cleans it up completely, maybe you put a check just in a different way to, you know, to attack it. Yeah. And I think what Scott is getting at, and I'm going to answer, uh, answer his question with some good old folk wisdom. You know, sometimes Scott, uh, dogs can have ticks and fleas, uh, <laughs> not just ticks. So, <laughs> so if that, uh, if that modified squat does improve drastically, you know you're going to focus a lot on that on that foot and ankle complex. But yeah, dogs can have ticks and fleas, so you may have to go back and do some uh, confirmation work and just see what's going on with the hip as well. That's it's very likely someone someone's going to have something going on in that hip, and you may have to address that as well uh, in your in your session. There's nothing there's nothing wrong with that. Um, so let's go. So Marty, back to you. Why are we doing, uh, why are we doing, uh, balance, balance training? Sure. And the balance is very important because as Wendy said, it's kind of like an activation or extended warm up, just like with core, you know, all human movement starts at the core. So that's why we put that in at the very beginning. So same thing with balance. Balance is an extension of a core process, right? So if I am able to do single leg exercise, that means my core is getting fired up because, you know, when you give a great definition of the core, I just look at it as if, you know, I'm chopping my arms and legs off, but my glutes are still part of my core. So I'm going to get my core by doing single leg balances or those type of exercises. But then also now I'm integrating those little muscles in the foot that have to communicate with my whole lower leg. So it's just another phenomenal way to, to get people prepared. And let's be honest, you know, I always joke around. We don't hop around like bunnies on two legs. We spend a lot of time on a single leg whether we're walking upstairs, walking down, running, cutting, jumping. So whether it's for your young athletes or your, you know, your senior athletes, there's nobody that doesn't need to have good balance. It just depends on why they need balance. We could get into the injuries where if someone can't hold a position and they go to change direction, they might tear an ACL. We can also talk about a senior, maybe that if they can't hold their balance, they may fall and cause a serious injury. So it's just another way to get that integration through the entire body, tie in that foot and ankle all the way up through the core for the higher demands that may follow if they're going to do anything in speed, agility, quickness, or reactive. Yeah, and also that's, uh, that's a good point. When we talk about balance, uh, every athlete every athlete can benefit from that. I, was just, I just had a conversation with an Olympic weightlifting coach. And part of their prep work is doing balance, holding the barbell, whether that's in the clean, the clean grip or the, the snatch grip. But they do balance work because there is that point moving that incredible load that you do have to you do have to balance so that you can change directions quickly to catch the weight. So everyone, if Olympic weightlifters moving hundreds of pounds over their heads need to do balance work, I think we can all. We can all get behind that as, as part of our training. Uh, so that leads us into reactive. Now that we've done our core work, we've done some balance, what's going on, number one, what's going on uh, in reactive training, uh, Wendy, in, in level one, phase one, and how is that different from what we call uh, plyometric? as well can you well, go ahead and answer that yeah so so again just kind of thinking about it as as kind of a flow you know if you're new to the opt model and you're studying this always think that everything that nasm is referencing and balance is done on one leg so that when it gets into reactive or plyo they're really used interchangeably so i mean any plyometric type exercise will prepare the neuromuscular system to move and perform at faster speeds so this is whether it's for sport for work or for life. So in stabilization, the focus is now um, not on high, like how high or far or how fast someone can jump, but rather um, how well they can decelerate and land while maintaining the proper posture and alignment of the lower extremity. So the focus on coaching and cueing and reinforcing the proper technique is going to be paramount. Most soft tissue injuries occur during you know deceleration. So we're going to want to make sure that the clients are developing adequate eccentric control, you know, isometric stabilization prior to focusing on developing and optimizing the concentric force production. And then the better the client gets at reducing forces eccentrically and stabilizing them isometrically, um, the greater their potential is going to be for producing force concentrically. 
So an example of this is going to be um, something as simple as a squat jumped with an isometric hold at the landing. And that's just so we can start to make sure that if their feet are turning out, we tell them to straighten it. And then we tell them to straighten it. And we tell them to straighten them every single rep. So therefore, the brain starts to say, oh, okay, this is how I'm supposed to land. Okay. Okay. And adding okay. on to that, <laughs> that is, no, no, that is very good. There's nothing more to add. There's nothing more to add, nothing more to ask. You explained it. You explained it perfectly. So now we can ask uh, we can ask Marty why uh, what is SAQ and why do we need to do it? And, and does everyone need to do some form of agility training? Excellent. So SAQ, speed, agility, quickness is that change of direction, footwork type of activity. So should everyone do it? Yes. Main reason I would say it is because in real life, we may have to react to an environment around us in a sense that, you know, I'm not always worried about, you know, running, you know, on, on a professional football field, right, where I have to cut on a dime and catch a ball. Not everyone's going to train like that. But I could walk downstairs here in a little bit and we just had some people in the house doing something. And if there's something on the ground, I may have to react quickly, hop, change direction, move, keep my center of gravity over a single leg. It's a carryover to everyday life. So one, it's fun. Most people enjoy it. Now, again, don't think that it has to be what you see on like YouTube videos where people are going at 100 miles an hour. It could be a very slow, methodical march, just getting people to be able to read the environment in front of them, react to what the cues are, and be able to keep their body moving under control as they appropriately change directions. It doesn't matter on the speed of it. It just talk, you know, Wendy knows that I do a lot of stuff on cognitive. It gets the brain even more engaged with the central nervous system. And there's huge benefits to that for elite athletes and everybody of all ages because we're all going to react to the environment around us at some point. And it could be on a single leg and it could be in any type of plane of motion. So it's great fun as well and it's good cardiovascular work. But I just like it more from that activities of daily living. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. And that that's important. And I've, I've always said as, as a coach, if, if we don't even, if we don't do SAQ in our sessions, do yourselves a favor, go to, uh, well, you can't do that now, but go to, uh, go to YouTube, get a dance class, go ahead and, and do a dance class and do some martial arts do some martial arts. And that's a fun way to handle all of that training. So it's not, so that you can do your workout for your workout and have this other fun activity as something that you can participate in. Now, Wendy, phase one, resistance training. What's happening there and is it gonna help me get jacked? Um, of course, right? <laughs> So, I mean, the intent of resistance exercises in phase one, um, it's to train and develop the muscular endurance and reinforce ideal total body posture alignment. And again, neuromuscular control and coordination in all planes of motion. Like I've said that all day, right? <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, essentially, we want to ensure that clients can perform fundamental movement patterns such as squatting, stepping, lunging, hinging, pushing, pulling, pressing, rotating, all of those without compensation in order to prepare them for later phases of training when they'll be doing things with heavier loads and at faster speeds. So we're trying to challenge postural alignment and control I mean, we want to put the clients in an environment that is that stresses the stable, like the stability of the core and moving the joints while they're working on their prime movers. So so with that said, I mean, resistance training in phase one is an opportune time to focus on the basics first before getting crazy with all these exercises that we see now. Um, and you want to put the clients in the most unstable position that they can handle um, to perform the exercises without compensating. Um, and then we want to think about, you know, alignment technique and then the, the pattern of the movement and then to make the exercises harder in this phase instead of just increasing the load and the amount of resistance that we use, um, we can leverage the neural continuum to provide the framework for progressions. So what I mean by that if, is if we start a client off with like a two arm, you know, standing cable chest press. We can then progress them to alternating arms, to single arm and then single arm with rotation. And each of these variations is going to place um, a different demand on the core and the shoulder stabilizers, all while working the prime movers during that, that particular pattern. 
but you know, alternatively, we can also add progressions to the lower body instead of just you know um, switching from a staggered stance. We can do a horizontal stance, a single leg stance. You know, all of these is going to place a different demand. You know, through uh, the lower extremity, the hips, the core, the shoulders. And then, you know, we can then combine them later, you know, with the upper body and the lower body. And, you know, basically you're only limited by your creativity and the client's ability to control that movement, you know, because because we're working on improving muscular endurance or I'm sorry, muscular and, and postural endurance, actually um, developing and reinforcing the proper movement patterns and then prioritizing the soft tissue health. Um, and so that's why we do these again, you know, we pick these particular exercises because that we want them done at a slower tempo. We want them to have higher repetition schemes, all emphasizing eccentric and then the isometric, um, aspects of each repetition that they do. That was kind of uh, long winded, but sorry. No, and I know that explained it, that explained it perfectly. Uh, just uh, what I want you to do, though, is, is highlight why we use the, the tempos that we do. Well, let's start with that. Why do we use the tempos that we do at this level? I mean, again, we're trying to focus on, you know, decelerating in the, you know, more I injuries. Again, I've said this a bunch and, and you can read, read it in the textbook. But more injuries happen while you're decelerating in the transverse pain, plane. So we want to actually think too, you're only as strong as you can control on the deceleration component, right? So when, or you're when you're eccentrically loading. So that's why we actually spend more time working on eccentric contractions first, because again, concentrically our body knows that we can produce power. That's easy, plus we've done that through training for so long, but slowing things down and being able to control it not only eccentrically, but then isometrically, and then producing the force, the, the outcome when we speed things up and we lift more weight, you know, we're waking up the stabilizers, the prime movers and everything. We're trying to get everything to play nicely together. So if we start eccentrically focusing first, then concentrically, when we produce the force, we're gonna have a better outcome. All right, and one more question for you. Now, uh, a lot of us are, we, we have to work out at home now. Yes. You mentioned the neural continuum. Yes. What do you say to that person who says, I'm supposed to be on my free motion machine at 1137. Now I can only do push ups. How do they how do they uh, how do they train and challenge that neural continuum with just a simple push up exercise? Well, again, if you're thinking about upper body, I mean, if you do a push up on like the wall, obviously the demand's different because think about gravity. And then if we change even just like the, the gravitational, like we bring it down to like a bench, it's going to be different than it was on the wall. Correct. So again, it's a different demand. Then if I place them on the floor with their knees on the ground, it's different. And then on the toes, it's going to be more challenging because it's harder, all focusing on a four to one tempo. But then you can change it up. That's where people like a lot of times like trainers kind of get in their own way, because when I have clients do a push up, I change it up each and every time. So if you have your hands on a ball, you're still doing a push-up. If you put your feet on the ball and your hands are on the ground, it's still a push-up, but it's still challenging different aspects of your body. So I think, you know, every single time you do something different, you know, if I put one hand on a medicine ball and one hand on the floor, then I'm changing it that way. If I add rotation to it, again, I'm still all working a push-up in phase one because I'm focusing on the tempo, my five kinetic chain checkpoints, drawing in, having perfect alignment, but I'm adding different demands to it. So so the body and and different muscles are always going to be challenged, even though it's one push up and you're doing it. I mean, a push up's a push up, right? So you're still getting the same joints and muscles activated. You're just adding a different demand on the core as okay. well as the environment. All right. Good. Thank you for that. Now, finally finished up. We're at the end of the workout. At the end of the workout, Marty, why are we cooling down? Why don't we just roll up out of the session, get back to work? <laughs> Yeah, that's what most people want to do, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> the key thing is we need to be prepared for the next session. And so going, taking that extra 10 minutes or so to foam roll helps bring that, you know, heart rate down potentially depending on your workout, but also helps get those muscles that you just put stress. And it's appropriate stress, but you're stressing muscle when you're challenging it. It helps take out that stress and helps keep the muscle more pliable. And then we go back and hit static stretching one more time 
for any of those muscles that we train that have a tendency to become overactive. So we again, we wanna make sure we restore proper length and that way now we're more a- able to recover. I mean, friends, I know you uh, maybe saw some of uh, the webinar we did yesterday myself with Kyle, we talked about recovery. And part of recovering is the soft tissue and the static stretching, but also you're recovering when you're in your ideal postures. So there's a whole, we got the nutrition component, we talked about sleep, but if you have just put stress into your body properly and you don't remove that stress, now you're building a continual stress load that at some point you're not gonna recover as well, you have a higher chance of injury, your joints now, again, as we talked about before, may have faulty movement patterns, So taking that extra seven to 10 minutes is going to be so worth it because you put all that work in so you get results. Why would you not want to finish the workout and make sure you restore yourself back to that equilibrium in a sense and make sure you're balanced back out? Plus, it's actually that's the best part of it because you're, you know, you know, you're done and it's like a it's a reward, right? Yeah, I know. Absolutely. Uh, Yeah. So thanks for that response. And I know that you have a. You have a cutoff, so let's get, uh, we have some frequently asked questions uh, that we've collected over the last few days. So let's start with you, Marty. Uh, Can you explain how cardio fits into programming and can you talk about a couple of cardio myths? Sure, so how it fits in the programming, again, when we write it in the book, it's in a perfect world scenario where everybody's coming in brand new in a sense and is willing to go through the model you know, in a continuum. So you take somebody that's brand new to fitness. That's why we have the stabilization training and everything there because it helps the tissue be prepared for a future load or, you know, establishing proper movement, etc. Well, same thing with the cardio. If they're generally going to be new, maybe deconditioned, you want to keep their heart rate low. You want to keep, you know, as they build the strength of their heart, just like you would with anything else. Now, It's possible you may have someone that's very uh, advanced cardiovascularly, but they've never done resistance training. If that's the case, then yes, you could move them to another level of training that you'd see in level two or level three. So we have level one purposely designed with stabilization training, our level two with strength endurance, and then our power with level three because it would make sense that somebody that's new to fitness wouldn't be ready for any of those advanced techniques until they got through the model. However, on occasion, you're going to find someone that may be a a marathon runner, and they are phenomenal cardiovascularly, but they've never done resistance training, and they don't move well. So that's when you can get creative if you need to. If they're more advanced in the cardiovascular, you can put them through a level two or level three, but you always keep people where they belong with the OPT models. You're uh, getting them to move well. Now, the interesting thing, though, is if they're not moving well, you may have to get creative with how you give them cardio. Because if they're not moving well, I don't want them maybe running or jumping or doing those things to get their heart rate up. So that's where, you know, you and I, Prentice, we might bring our boxing in because it's low impact, right, on the lower body. Maybe you put them in a pool. Maybe you put them on a bike so you can still challenge their heart rate to the level that they're already currently capable of while you let their orthopedic structure catch up. But if they're brand new to fitness, just follow the model and it's a perfect thing. Now, as far as myths with cardiovascular training – One of the things that I always talk about is, well, I can't do any of my warm-up until I go do some cardio because I need to warm up my body. Well, if they don't move well and I put them on a treadmill, guess what I've done? I've now made them move on one leg, something like a squat at high speeds to get them warmed up, and I'm just adding stress. Last time I checked, all of our muscles are 98.6 degrees anyways. We're not going to all of a sudden warm up our body before we go do stretching. So. You don't need to do that cardiovascular work before you do the foam rolling and the static stretching. That's if, it w- if the science showed that, we'd have it there. So that's one myth that I think people have to kind of readjust. Don't put them on cardio to overload their movement system before you then go try to correct it. And then number two is that fat burning myth. Yes, at a lower heart rate, you will burn more fat. But the studies were done on people that were sleeping. The body wants to survive. So the body purposely burns more fat at rest because in theory, when I got up after eight hours, back in the day, I didn't walk to my fridge to get food. I had to go hunt it. So I had to have some carbohydrate stores left so I could do maybe some of that sprinting to go chase my breakfast. So there's nothing wrong with going on a slower tempo. There's a point in time to it. But if you really want to improve cardio or burn calories, it's really how much energy do you expend? So 
yes, I'll burn more fat potentially in that lower heart rate, but I burned less calories. At the end of the day, to burn more body fat, it's how much calorie expenditure did you get? Okay. All right. So thank you for that. And I have, I want to get a couple of questions that were specifically pegged for you out of the way. Sure. Uh, so do you have to perform a total body workout in phase one or can you break it up into body parts? And if so, how would you do that? Sure. Absolutely. Just like anything else, if a client can come in and only spend 30 minutes with me, I'm not going to say, oh, too bad. You can't work out. I need 45 minutes to an hour. So we teach it as total body. It's great total body because of all the things Wendy talked about with core. I brought in with balance. There's that total body integration. But you can absolutely do different splits. There's no question about that. So the way I like to do it myself, there's multiple ways. I like to do a push-pull together in all phases. So if I'm doing anything with chest, I want to bring my back into it because that helps me stay balanced. And that's how I like to do it. And if I'm doing a lot of shoulder work, since I'm already – kind of hitting my triceps to not overtrain them in the course of the week. If I'm going to do arms, I would do my triceps with my shoulders and then I might do biceps with my pulling because I'm already kind of attacking that joint motion. So, but for me, it's always going to be a push pull together just to kind of, again, always reestablish that ideal posture. Okay, great. And, and Wendy, why are, uh, why are arms optional? <laughs> Um, well, you, I don't want to downplay the importance and relevance of a nice set of guns. So, because I personally love training arms, um, but it, I mean, but in this phase, since we're typically recommended total body, as Marty just said, total body multi joint exercises, and emphasizing develop developing a proper fundamental movement patterns, um, that's where the buys and tries are working anyway. So it may be more effective use of training time to admit dedicated, just specific, you know, dedicated specifically just to arms. Um, but now with that said, you know, if it's relevant to your client and then you, you know, then you certainly can include them as a client's choice, if you will. Um, you can also incorporate arm specific movements into combo patterns like a, a, you know, a squat curled overhead press or a cobra, you know, to tricep kickback. Um, again, that's where creativity comes in. Okay. And it seems like you're getting all of the uh, optional questions today, but uh, <laughs> why, why, is reactive, uh, why is reactive optional in uh, phase one, Wendy? Um, well, reactive is optional in phase one because certain clients may not be able to handle the demands of the reactive or the plyometric type exercises when starting their training program. So two, you know, ideally you may want to you know, make sure that a client can maintain proper core and lower body alignment first through their core and balance training exercises prior to including reactive training. But again, with that said, exercises should be designed and progressed and more specifically regressed um, relative to the client's capabilities. Um, you know, reactive exercises can be regressed in a variety of ways for more deconditioned clients to help get neuromuscular, their neuromuscular system used to decelerating and, stable, decelerating and stabilizing their speeds um, at a faster rate than what they're typically used to without even putting them in the de demands that we're asking them to do that may not be safe for them. Yeah, exactly. And just... Yeah, your client's a living, breathing human being with <laughs> unique needs. So definitely don't follow a template because it's written down that way. You know, you have to address, you have to meet them where they are and give them the training loads, the training stimuli that they can handle. And I know you have to take off, Marty. So do you have time for one more question? Yep. Uh, can you use standard weight machines in phase one training, seeing how it needs to be in an unstable environment? And Absolutely. I may have answered part of that earlier, <laughs> just a couple of seconds ago, but go ahead. <laughs> No, absolutely, because it's about what they can control. So if I have to teach them a pushing pattern and they can't stabilize their spine yet, that's fine. I want to get them off that as quick as possible for the stabilization phase. But day one, there might be so much going on in them to the gym. They're, you know, they don't know what's going on. That might just be the easiest way to teach them a push because it's guiding them and it's supporting their spine. You're still going to use the same tempos, but you're going to progress them by getting them in a more unstable environment. That's all. It's just what they can control. Okay, perfect. Thank you for uh, joining us today, Marty. I know you have to uh, take off. Uh, so thanks again for all of your input and your wisdom. And we'll see you uh, next time. Before you head off, tell people how they can uh, find you. 
in the uh, in the social media space? Yep, it's uh, Miller Marty seven two is my Instagram, so that's the easiest way to find me. So thank you so much. All right, you take care. We'll catch up soon, guys. Be well. Okay. Bye. Bye. So. <laughs> just the two of us. Just the two of us. Uh, so, question for you. Okay. What's the difference between uh, vertical and horizontal loading? And um, I have a follow-up for that. When When is it appropriate to use either one? Okay. So... Vertical loading involves pushing and pulling exercises in overhead patterns. And of course, horizontal loading involves pushing and pulling in more of the front of the body. But those are like the literal definitions. So in context of the program design using the OPT model, um, vertical loading essentially just means that the client is performing all their exercises in their program or a section of their program back to back in a circuit format. Um, the NASM workout template is oriented vertically so basically is referring um to going just vertically down the template until all the exercises are complete and then if applicable repeating that circuit for the re recommended number of rounds uh, you know on the other hand when we're talking about horizontal loading it's referring to more traditional format um where a client performs the prescribed sets of exercises prior to moving on to the next exercise so essentially moving horizontally across the workout template for each exercise in the program. So your client would do one set, then they would rest for the prescribed amount of time and then repeat that same exercise until all the sets are complete. And then they'll move on to the next exercise and repeat in the same fashion until the, the entire program is completed. Okay. All right. And so just I'm guessing we may have a follow-up question. Are both of these, are both of these, uh, loading uh, loading parameters and both of these loading parameters okay to do in phase one training i mean you definitely can because again somebody that's new that, to exercise may need that zero to 90 second rest because their body isn't used to physical activity so if they if they're learning a new pattern so for instance let's you know we take chest for granted but let's say someone's never done a chest press before if we spend time teaching them how to perform that chest press at a four to one tempo, and then they need a break, we wanna give them that rest and then we can repeat it again so then they start to get used to that specific movement pattern. And that follows along with any of the exercises. However, because it is a slower, you know, like a four to one tempo and you're doing anywhere from 12 to 20 repetitions, if you give them that zero to 90 and then repeat it, I mean, that they may not be able to get as many exercises in per se, in their workout when they're with you for an hour. Okay, great. Now, finally, well, no, we have two more questions, but uh, this one comes up a lot. And I know okay. that with uh, there may be a little more flexibility as the new CPT course comes out, but does everyone start in phase one with you? Um, well, you know, Marty provided some great options and recommendations before, you know, and so for clients who might, you know, be resistant to start in phase one, um, I don't tell them, you know, but generally, yes, I, I do, you know, we recommend that everyone start in phase one if possible. So basically, regardless of the client type, phase one is going to raise the ceiling for potential of all results from a program while enhancing the resilience of the body. So for deconditioned clients or those new to training, it's a great place to begin. And that's the reasons that why we've already, you know, for reasons we've already discussed, but we are really going to help to prime the body for the intensities of the training that we will see later on in the OPT model. Now for advanced or more experienced clients and athletes, I mean, it's a great place to start and to reset. So for many training, you know, in this way, you know, um, it's novel stimulus. And so for clients who haven't done it, it provides a tremendous amount of opportunity, um, you know, not only to get their bodies in the right, you know, right, um, you know, right uh, alignment, but for improving muscle imbalances, general pain and soreness, stability, patterning, all the stuff we talked about before. But we're stressing the neuromuscular system in a way that often facilitates improvements in the body and their composition and their strength and their performance because they haven't trained that way before. 
Now for those coming off, you know, um, for those that are, you know, coming off more intense training cycles or types of training, like let's say a competitive season, um, in the case of an athlete, you know, phase one is, is it a great way to deload and focus on qualities and adaptations that may have been diminished or lost. So for example, a client who's been doing lots of traditional strength and her power work, you know, may have lost or haven't fully developed the optimal core joint and posture stability and control that we talked about. So this is why we want to work to regain that, you know, oftentimes as a result, a client's going to come out of phase one stronger and more power powerful, and they haven't done any traditional strength or power work, you know, or an athlete who's been grinding during the season, they need a break. And so, you know, they're going to benefit training at lower and relative intensities in phase one, because again, you know, we're going to ramp up their training again a little bit later. And then like lastly, as we mentioned before, you know, just because it's phase one, it doesn't mean that it's easy. You know, it's actually quite the contract contrary. And, um, you know, there's such a misconception that phase one's all about st stability tools and light weights and body weights, you know, which may be true. But in reality, the training intensity should be relative to the client, you know, their ability to perform, you know, the programmed exercise at the right tempo for the, you know, the recommended number of sets without compensation, you know. And, and the last thing I'm going to say about that is, like, you know, I have an MBA client uh, that comes in and, you know, I have him do, you know, step up more in phase one, like if he needs to have a phase one day or we're doing phase one training just because he came out of a season, I have him doing step up to balance you know, again, stabilization leg exercise, you know, onto an 18 inch box holding on to 50 pound weights. And he does 12 reps at the, you know, a three or four to one tempo, you know, so don't be afraid to load the clients, you know, in the phase, but just make sure that they can meet the requirements while maintaining proper alignment. Exactly. I think you said that perfectly. Every, again, for, for those of you listening, each one of your clients is unique and mm -hmm. Having said that, each of them have a different ceiling. So exactly. someone's phase one workout may very well be phase three or four for someone else. So you have to meet yeah. that client, absolutely meet that client where they are, just adhering to the uh, adhering to the acute variables and you know, just load them appropriately, understanding that yeah, everyone has a different ceiling. Everyone has something differently that they're going to respond to, which leads us to our last question, talking about unique individuals and ceilings. What do you do if you don't have buy-in from the client and they don't want to do phase one? Well, again, you know, and, and I think a lot of this lies on the trainer because when I do my assessment and I, and I realize that my client needs to be in phase one, or again, if it's one of my athletes and they come back from the season, I don't call it phase one, you know? So, so again, I may, you know, have them go and say, okay, this is what we're going to do next. And then, you know, go into a side plank and, you know, ball bridges, but I'll put a weight on their hips on a ball bridge. And so again, it's still phase one. I just don't call it that. And so I think a lot of times we get so caught up in our terminology of what we're saying that we need to kind of step back and say, these are the exercises I want you to perform and don't tell them that there is stabilization endurance exercise. And, um, and I have really never had anyone tell me that they're not going to do an exercise because again, they trust my knowledge. They trust what I'm finding and it's challenging because I slow them down. So I don't, really think I answered sure. that but no I, I, I think <laughs> I think you did and I, I just want to if I may summarize a couple of the things that you said and that goes back to how we how we represent the the training that we're doing we don't call it phase one I don't think I don't think I use the the Latin names of muscles okay. unless I'm talking to one of my unless I'm talking to a colleague or you know, I'm in a trivia, I'm at trivia night. And that's, you know, you can pull a couple of weird muscles out of the bag, but definitely talking to customers, some person whose goal is only to, to get in shape for a competition, you know, I'm meeting them where they are and I'm using language also that they understand. And I'm also mapping every single thing that I'm doing to, to their goals. And you always have to go back to, this is going to help you get to where you wanna go faster, faster, and hopefully in a little safer manner. 
Well, and so, another, just to add on to that, Prentice, too, is a lot of time the exercise is hard. So yes. if you have them do an exercise and it's hard and it's a stabilization and it's hard because you slowed it down, then, again, that's all that they want. They really come in to get their, their butt kicked. And yeah. you're going to do that in phase one if you do it right. Yeah. Yeah. If you stick to the <laughs> – yeah, if you stick to the variables and you meet the client where they are – and you're able to explain that you're doing this to help them to get better, definitely, you should have no complaints. Right. <laughs> Everyone should buy in to, uh, to what you're doing. Well, that's all the time uh, we have today. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Wendy, for hopping on with us. I think we'll be spending uh, more time together, at least through May. Uh, right. Thank you, uh, Thank you, Greg, for keeping the ship running back there in the uh, in the background. And before we sign off today, uh, do we have any more questions? OK, we're clear. So, Wendy, tell us again how we can find you in social media to ask you a lot of questions. <laughs> and my Instagram is Wendy.bats13. Twitter is just WendyBats13. And as always, you can email me at Wendy.bats at NASM.org. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you for all of, for those of you who listen to us for this hour. You all have a great day and be safe.